Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John O'Connor, and it's my privilege to be able to moderate today's presentation, which is the Taiwan US Development Partnership Dialogue Financing for Green, Resilient, and Inclusive Development. We're very fortunate to have some terrific panelists who come from policy, finance, and training and community for circular development. I, I will be introducing our panelists shortly, but I'd like to turn the floor over immediately to Ambassador Lee, Director General of TICO in New York, to make some opening and framing comments. Mr. Ambassador, over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell, for moderating today's event. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my warm welcome to you all for joining today's SAI event, Taiwan-U.S. Development Partnership Dialogue Financing for Green, Resilient, and Inclusive Development. I would also like to thank Taiwan ICDF for co-hosting this event. We are honored to have representatives and experts from the U.S. De uh, Department of the Treasury, USAID, and the American Think Tank Stimson Center, as well as panelists from Taiwan Financial Supervisory Commission, FSC, and Taiwan ICDF. A special guest, Ms. Tina El Nemto, stage the Marshall Islands Climate Envoy, is also here to share her insights with us today. <clears throat> as President Biden said yesterday in his address to the 76th UNGA, the extreme weather event represents what the UN Secretary General has rightly referred to as cold rat for humanity. The Paris Agreement and the upcoming COP26 send an urgent and powerful signal to the international community, indicating that global efforts are needed in order to make further progress toward green, resilient, and inclusive development. As a responsible stakeholder that is aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Taiwan wished to play the proactive role in tackling climate change. For example, President Tsai pledged Taiwan's commitment to actively working toward carbon neutrality by 2050 on Earth Day this year. And last year, Taiwan's Financial Supervisory Commission launched Taiwan's Green Finance Initiative 2.0. In addition, Taipei Exchange also launched a sustainable bond market to promote corporate sustainability this May. Through this green finance plan, Taiwan aims to encourage green investment and improve transparency. The government is currently amending the Greenhouse Gas Reduction and Management Act to speed up the progress. All of these examples show that Taiwan is taking a whole of government approach to sustainable financing. Today's event highlights that Taiwan is looking forward to working with our allies and like-minded countries who share the same conviction in green and inclusive development finance. I'm convinced, I'm confident that this event will lead to greater awareness and broader collaboration. Thank you, and I look forward to a productive discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I'd like now to take a moment to introduce our panelists and let them make a quick comment about the nature of the mission of their specific organization. I'd first like to introduce Craig Hart, Deputy Ad Assistant Administrator, Bureau for Asia, United States Agency for International Development. Craig, might you take a minute to describe your mission and your organization, and perhaps you could illuminate it with a comment or two about um, some of your transactions and one that particularly stands out for you. Mr. Connor, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Craig Hart. I'm the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Asia at the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. So in this role, I oversee a wide-ranging um, range of development efforts across East Asia and the Pacific. Uh, 
But of course, I mean, some may not be familiar with USAID, so let me just quickly introduce. Um, we're an independent U.S. government agency. Uh, we receive overall foreign policy guidance from the Secretary of State. Our ability to work in fragile, hard-to-reach contexts makes us critical to President Biden's focus on climate change, a crisis that he has described as the number one issue facing humanity. In 80 countries and through over 100 programs worldwide, USAID builds resilience to climate impacts while helping our partners meet their climate mitigation targets and adaptation needs. So in Asia, we work in more than 30 countries spanning Central, South, and Southeast Asia, as well as the Pacific Island countries. And to just give you an idea of, the, of our scope, we anticipate an FY 2021 regional budget of approximately $1.16 billion. We have more than 1,200 staff in Asia and approximately 100 staff here in Washington also focused on Asia. So this long-term dedicated field presence is critical to the success of our partnerships and of our results. Very much appreciate you having me here today and look forward to this discussion. Um, as I understood, Mr. O'Connor, in terms of addressing how USAID is advancing green development in Asia and some quick examples maybe. So uh, across the Indo-Pacific, USAID supports the Biden-Harris administration's bold climate agenda and assists our partner countries with implementing the Paris Agreement. USAID partners with countries to help prepare them for climate disasters also and make natural resources more sustainable. So we support them in reducing emissions, transitioning to clean energy, and improving air quality while increasing water and food security for their citizens. And we work with the private sector partners, which are extremely important for us, and international donors to leverage additional resources for climate change investment and identify sustainable alternatives to non-transparent development models. So as for our, qu our quick examples of successes in the green development space, um, USAID, USAID is very proud of our successes in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, for example, USAID's facilitated solar investments totaling over 300 million to accelerate Vietnam's transition to clean, secure, market-driven energy system. Our partnerships and our policy guidance helped contribute to a massive increase in solar energy production from less than 2% of the country's total power generation to nearly a quarter in just a few years. And in addition, we work with the Vietnamese investors to build and grid connect seven renewable energy projects using U.S. technologies and expertise. In India, USAID's efforts inform the government of India's roadmap for deploying renewable energy solutions. USA helped India integrate five gigawatts of renewable energy into the power grid, which reduced 30 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. And it's basically enough to, in terms of the, the amount of power that that's creating, to power 3.3 million households. And in the Pacific region, USA helped our partners access over $200 million in climate finance from multilateral funds, such as the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, and the Global Environment Facility. So with our support, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, for example, secured a $25 million uh, from the Green Climate Fund to reduce vulnerabilities in their water sector caused by climate change. So we're eager to continue working with our partner countries and the private sector to achieve these types of bold climate actions. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hart, that's terrific. Thank you very much. I think that helps us all uh, bring the mission into a tangible understanding. I'd like to now introduce uh, Lida Fitz, Deputy Assistant Secretary and Investment, Energy, and Infrastructure for the United States Department of the Treasury. Perhaps our, one of our most important policy-making organizations. And perhaps, Ms. Fitz, you can talk as well about your mission and how you use the policy making function to advance some of our shared objectives. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I, my name is Lida Fitz, and I am the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Investment, Energy, and Infrastructure at the U.S. Treasury. And our deputy leads U.S. Treasury's work on private sector investment in energy and infrastructure, including overseeing the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, 
seat on the board representing the US in the G20 Infrastructure Working Group and Global Infrastructure Hub, including leading the launch and implementation of new bilateral engagements on sustainable infrastructure finance. Uh, and more recently, our office has been involved in the development of the G7 Task Force on Build Back Better World. As some of you may be know, at the June summit in Cornwall, President Biden and G7 leaders agreed to develop concrete actions to meet infrastructure needs in low and middle income countries through the launch of B3W. If done the right way with transparent, sustainable investment in projects that respond to countries' needs and engage local workers to maintain high labor and environmental standards, infrastructure can be a strong foundation that allows societies in low and middle income countries to grow and prosper. Through B3W, G7 and other like-minded partners will coordinate in mobilizing international financial institutions, development finance institutions, and private sector capital in four focus areas climate, health and health security, digital technology, and gender equity and equality. Aside from B3W, our deputy helps Treasury deliver on several of the Biden administration's new International Climate Finance Plan goals, namely scaling up international climate finance, mobilizing private finance, and promoting an end to international official financing for carbon-intensive fossil fuel-based energy. Our office work also includes leadership of the design and implementation of bilateral sustainable finance partnerships in key countries. And these engagements respond to country priorities, including issues like ESG investing, green bonds, FX lending, debt aggregation, credit guarantees, project bankability, innovative financing, the whole list of issues that can be barriers if not addressed to private sector investment. Again, thank you for having me here today, and I look forward to an interesting discussion on how we can increase cooperation on sustainable finance. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, also introduce um, from our partners in Taiwan, Ambassador Timothy Xiong, Secretary General of Taiwan ICDF, and Jasmine Liu, Director of Financial Supervisory Commission in the New York office. My apologies for not introducing you first, as a good host would have. But uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, to, uh, Mr. Ambassador, if you'd like to introduce the vision of ICDF and how you're bringing your capabilities to bear on this incredibly important topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ms. O'Connell. Uh, I'm Tim Zixiang, the Secretary General of Taiwan International Corporation and Development Fund, Taiwan ICDF. Uh, ICDF is the professional aid agency in Taiwan, and we focus on six priority areas of operations, including agriculture, information and communication, technologies, public health, education, environment, and SME development. To fulfill our mission, these areas of operation are carried out by our departments of technical cooperation, humanitarian assistance, international education, and the training, lending and investment, and research, development, and evaluation. Currently, we have 96 ongoing projects in 37 countries and 22 technical missions with around 250 professionals in the Asia Pacific, West Asia, Africa, and uh, Latin American and the Caribbean. And actually, the difference of ICDF with other aid agencies, we sent uh, technical missions and stationed in different countries and provide people-to-people -people advanced technical support. Well, that's the short introduction now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Ambassador. Ms. Liu, did you want to expand on, on your organization's mission and goals? Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning, Taipei. So um, I'm Jasmine Liu, the uh, FSC in your office director. The Financial Supervisory Commission is, uh, was established in July 2004. With, uh, we are a single regulator of financial watchdog responsible for the supervision and development of banking securities and the insurance markets in Taiwan. Uh, in 2005, the FSC New York office was established to promote mutual understanding and the relationship between US and Taiwan. So um, as a supervisor, uh, 
our job is to make sure that material risk, including climate risk to financial systems, are measured, disclosed, and mitigated properly, thereby strengthening the resilience of the financial system as a whole. And facing the formidable uh, challenges from the climate change, the private sector cannot meet these challenges alone, and the governments need to step, step, uh, step up and lead them. So to, uh, in order to uh, scale up the uh, private sector's uh, input in the uh, sustainability transition through financial institutions investing and the financial decision-making process, the FSD launched the uh, Green Finance Action Plan 2.0 last August last year. The action plan can be uh, the action plan uh, has uh, three underpinning strategies. Uh, one is to spur the financial institution to address climate-related risks and capitalize on the uh, opportunities associated therewith. Uh, the second one is to strengthen the uh, quality of the ESG disclosure uh, information uh, transparency. Last, the last one is to use the financial market force, the mechanism to steer our e economic uh, economy toward a sustainable development, a sustainable future for all. So uh, that's pretty much what uh, FAC has done so far. We have uh, re uh, achieved a major, uh, major uh, uh, achievements in uh, green financing and uh, green financial products and also information disclosure. For example, uh, in Asia, uh, Taiwan already, uh, we have uh, 10 domestic banks supported the e equator principles to factor the uh, sustainability into their project financing. And we are the number one in Asia as of the end of August 2021. That uh, sends us eloquent testimony to our efforts of the FSC so far. So uh, I will conclude my remark here. So lastly, I would say I have to commend John, you are so versatile to moderate a panel and the drive at the same time. <laughs> as a regulator, I have to say that probably has some bearing on your business. Okay, that's it. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I'm not driving at the moment, but I did pull over to the side of the road, so I'm not violating any U.S. or uh, federal or state laws currently. Um, but thank you. Um, I'd now like to introduce Brian Finley, uh, President and CEO of the Stimson Center, which is doing some incredibly innovative work in terms of prioritization indices and matrices. And uh, Brian, maybe you can give us some background on uh, the Stimson Center and uh, what your efforts are centered on. Yeah, happy to do it, John. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and thanks for the uh, the introduction. I, my colleague stole the, the words right out of my mouth. You give new meaning to the show must go on, uh, John. <laughs> Despite the inclement weather here in Washington, it's your military background, I think, uh, that, uh, that, that gets us here. I'm really grateful and I really also wanna commend uh, Taiwan ICDF for hosting today's event and thank them for including me in this conversation and for all they do uh, in this space. I think that uh, you uh, they have demonstrated amply and I hope we'll hear a little bit more uh, here today um, uh, from them about some of their activities uh, uh, around the world because I think they have brought some significant innovation uh, innovation to the space to be sure. As John mentioned, uh, my name is Brian Finlay. I'm the president and CEO at the Stimson Center. Stimson, for those of you that may uh, be less familiar with us is a public policy think tank with offices uh, here in the United States as well as in Europe, although uh, in truth, a significant, perhaps the most significant uh, proportion of our work actually does occur uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, for, for us, uh, while much of our, I think, historical focus has really been on security issues, of course, uh, in more and more, uh, there is no longer a neat division between security issues and other issues of global import, be they security issues or development issues or economic issues, uh, ecological issues. There is a, increasingly a blurring of, uh, 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 of those spaces. And, and it's a space, I think, for Stimson that we are most interested in, in concentrating our attention. I think nowhere is that more apparent today than, than with the climate crisis over the past 30 years or so, Stimson has really prided itself on breaking down those stovepipes that exist. And if you serve in government and if you uh, are from private industry, you will recognize this, uh, this comment that there are stovepipes that naturally occur uh, in order to help us organize ourselves uh, to meet uh, 
to meet challenges. Um, and, and I think increasingly we are seeing, again, because of that blurring of issues, uh, a growing need to, to break down those silos, those stovepipes between substantive issue areas, between public and private sectors, between uh, governments of the North and South, uh, and, and so forth. And so in that regard, uh, I think we at, at Stimson have really managed to build a, a nice track record, John, um, in terms of building sustainable, uh, what we call uncommon alliances between uh, constituencies that might otherwise not find themselves collaborating with one another. Uh, but in, in more specifically to your question, John, uh, for our part, we've launched a new project with Taiwan ICDF over the course of the past year, uh, which aims to help governments and private industry uh, in vulnerable, particularly in island nations, uh, but coastal uh, uh, regions around the world, uh, access climate finance um, in order to build resilient coastal cities. Our uh, global initiative, which I would love to tell you more about as the conversation goes on, uh, we call the CORVI, the Climate and Ocean Risk Vulnerability Index, focuses on helping decision makers, whether they are in private sector, or, or in the public space, uh, fill uh, really data gaps, if you will, to understand the full risk picture and thereby allowing for investment to kind of tackle uh, these issues in the most uh, 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 effective, but also the most efficient way. And so uh, with that, John, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, but really look forward to, uh, uh, to the conversation ahead. Well, thank you, Brian. And, and finally, uh, and but by no means, uh, least important um, is Tina Stege, Special Envoy on Climate Change, Government of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And I, I for one, am honored to have the opportunity to be on the panel with you, Ms. Stege, because you're, you're closest to the, the problem, if you will. The Marshall Islands is living experientially the impacts of climate change on a day-to-day -day basis which we feel much less here in the United States. And as we have this, uh, we, we're delighted to have you here today. And perhaps you can talk a bit about your mission as the special envoy and uh, how, how we can all think about enabling your, your greater mission. Thank you so much. Como tata. Thank you in, um, in, in Marshallese and Yahweh, which is how we say hello. And uh, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge and appreciate um, Ambassador Lee and his staff for in, inviting me initially to, to join this conversation. Uh, I am, as John has explained, my name is Tina Stege. I, I work as Climate Envoy for the Republic of the Marshall Islands. I'm actually based in New York. Um, where I try to do as much as possible um, uh, multilaterally um, to help the Marshall Islands get its story out there. And for a long time, the Marshall Islands, um, for those who may not be aware, has been really at the forefront of advocacy um, internationally, particularly on the, the, the mitigation side of, of the climate of the climate story, uh, really pushing for greater emissions reductions for, for years now, being at the forefront of the call for um, keeping 1.5 uh, in reach um, as the temperature goal that you know really underpins our ability to, to survive well into the future um, on the islands uh, where we live. Uh, for those who may not know the Marshall Islands, we're in the Pacific. Um, just about a five hour flight west of Hawaii, but before you reach Guam. So um, all our islands are coral atoll islands. So that means no more than six feet above, of sea, above sea level. And in fact, the highest point on the island that I grew up in, Madro, which is the capital, is about say 15 feet and it's a, it's a man-made bridge. So uh, we are very much on the front of the front lines of this crisis. And as I had said before, we've been at the forefront um, advocating for greater remissions reductions um, globally. Uh, but when I began my work, part of it was that we realized very much that we needed to pivot to look domestically at what could be done 
to adapt to the world that is changing before our eyes. It's been changing before our eyes in the Pacific for a very long time. And I think clearly in the last year and more, we've seen around the world that climate change is um, impacting everyone everywhere. Um, and so now we're really focused on adaptation and, and trying to come up with solutions. And I just want to say that the United States and Taiwan are really bilaterally cl our closest partners. And um, we look to be partnering with them uh, in the month, weeks and months and, and years ahead. This decade is the critical one. Um, and for us in particular, very critical as the time we have to, to find solutions for the, for the coral atoll nations is quite short. Um, so it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be sitting here with our closest partners um, and having this discussion today. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is propose um, a series of questions, quite few, but then have each of our uh, distinguished panelists um, answer from their perspective. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Ambassador Xiang, and the first question is really um, how is the question of balancing the de demands of the short term COVID crisis in the context of the demands of the long term climate crisis? And so the specific question is having witnessed how COVID 19 has impa impacted existing development financing. What are the lessons learned um, and from your perspective and how will that influence putting measures in place to ensure that sustainable financing continues ahead uh, as we have future outbreaks or other anticipated crises? So, Mr. Ambassador, what are your lessons learned about how you balance these kind of long and short term crises, sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, to answer this question, uh, first, I will start with some facts. The OECD estimated that the annual financing gap to achieve the SDGs is 2.5 trillion US dollars. Uh, coupled with increasing needs and declining resources following the COVID 19 outbreak, estimated at 1.7 trillion US dollars. So there is a total 4.2 trillion US dollars gap for sustainable financing. During the pandemic, I would say the lesson we learned are the importance of local knowledge and the innovative measures to broaden partnerships, or simply says the localization and innovation are the key or the essential for sustainable financing. Uh, let me give you some examples to show how we learned the lessons. The first one is in Paraguay. We have a project named Strengthen Capacity to Support Development of Micro, Small, Medium Enterprises since 2019. It aims to support or assist Paraguay in upgrading the operational performance of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises and upgrading the functions of the relevant consultation mechanism. However, because of the pandemic or say the challenge to the small, medium enterprises, we decided to modify the project and assisted Association of Fashion Industry to establish the standards for fiber masks and created a new market for the fabric manufacturers. So instead of losing business opportunities during the pandemic, with the project's help, they successfully produced 3 million masks for sale, which to our SMEs a great a huge revenue. The reason we can act faster during the pandemic is because we dispatched the long-term professional team in Paraguay and work hand-in-hand -hand with them. So we know their strengths and can easily integrate local resources to create synergy. Besides, we also include non-traditional financing source from the public in Taiwan to increase the awareness of our allies through a new business model, crowdfunding. So we attracted over 500 participants to join in our call to action and received over $100,000 contribution. It means we include our partnerships, not only the private sectors, also the people. 
So I would say innovation, localization, and the partnerships are the three key elements to ensure future outbreak of other natural disasters is kept to a minimum. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, um, sir. Um, Craig, would you like to amplify on top of any of those since you work at the local level as well as the global level? Any other lessons learned in juggling the long and the short term crises? Well, John, actually, let me let me comment a little bit about uh, I think USAID's excitement in terms of being able to work with AIT and Tecro um, to elevate USAID's relationship with Taiwan. Um, it really does highlight our ability to to share the democratic values and reaffirms Taiwan's role as a valued development and humanitarian assistance partner. Um, and so, as we look at to, to address our shared global and re regional priorities, including the free and open Indo-Pacific. And so, on that basis, if you will, that kind of foundation, um, we're very proud to be able to work with Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific, as well as um, Latin America and Africa on key issues, including expanding internet connectivity, uh, the government's use of IT and improving service delivery. And we're also collaborating with Taiwan on humanitarian assistance uh, on health, including COVID-19, democratic governance, and climate change. So that kind of gives you a sense as to the breadth of the relationship, which we're very excited about. Um, and so a couple of quick examples, maybe. Um, in July 21, uh, USAID worked with AIT to collaborate with uh, Taiwan ICDF on a two-part training for health leaders, managers, practitioners, and development partners from 10 Pacific Island countries. The training boosted the ability to use health, the health workforce data and advance national health goals responding to emergency threats and delivering better health services to citizens. Um, our collaboration is in, in terms of e-governance and cybersecurity training for government IT employees uh, in Nauru, Marshall Islands, Palau, Tuvalu, and, and, and others is slated next month in October of 21. Um, and in terms of, again, laying the foundation and thinking about the ongoing cooperation that we have um, in climate change, USA is very pleased to be able to work with Taiwan ICDF on fisheries, climate, on disaster management act actions in the Pacific. Um, in addition, I'm excited to announce that last month, just last month, we established a climate-focused working group to identify the key areas for collaboration in climate finance and natural disaster management. And that really does come from our lessons learned in terms of being able to come together and collaborate with our partners. Um, already this group has identified opportunities to collaborate in the Pacific, such as facilitating trilateral co cooperation on climate resilience and coastal fisheries and supporting local civil society organizations who are engaged in climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction, which as you pointed out earlier, is a critical issue across the, the region. So we're looking forward to advancing these opportunities through our partnership. Um, and USAID's also very excited about expanding uh, the potential expansion of our cooperation with ta Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. And we recognize that Taiwan ICDF plays a valuable role in terms of mobilizing sustainable finance, as was just pointed out, for climate change priorities. And our recently announced Pacific American Fund supports local civil society organizations in 12 Pacific countries to make headway on, pr on pressing development challenges, including climate change adaptation. So we're looking forward to figuring out how we can partner and, and looking to expand that partnership um, as we're exploring the possibility of collaboration with Taiwan through the fund and on climate changes in countries where we have shared interests. Thanks, John. Thank you, and, and maybe we could sort of come up a little bit, uh, back away from the problem from a broader perspective uh, Ms. Liu, um, and also uh, Ms. Fitz, as as regulators and rule makers and policy makers, um, you've had to juggle the impacts of the short, you know, the immediate in the pandemic crisis, as against the backdrop of the long term of climate crisis. How do you see evolving your approach to these questions, and uh, individually, and then how might you synchronize it? Ms. Liu, could you comment first, please? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I think uh, both the COVID-19 and the uh, climate uh, COVID-19 and the climate change, they presented to us as a risk. Both are risk, but there's uh, one thing in common. They are both risk, but this 
distinction between uh, these two is COVID-19 is unforeseeable. Before the start of 2020 last year, uh, the market is still very promising. And then suddenly there's a, a sudden impact uh, from the COVID-19 on the market. And the uh, climate change, on the, other hand, on the other hand, it's a foreseeable risk. You know that it's going to happen. So as a regulator, we have to address it. And for COVID-19, it's just like a live stress testing. Thank God due to maybe part of the efforts of from the uh, lesson learned from the 2000, 2008 uh, global financial crisis, the, the financial system as a whole, we have strengthened our resilience. So this time we remain uh, relatively unscathed. But the question is for us is how to uh, remain resilient and uh, where you can support the econ economy, the uh, business, the industry to develop. So uh, as a regulator, we have uh, launched uh, a series of the uh, preliminary uh, measures to alleviate the uh, regulatory restraints for a financial institution uh, to cope with the uh, needs of the uh, business in uh, in stre uh, stressful business, business during the COVID-19. And I think it's a very successful, just uh, like what the US has done before. So uh, the economy already uh, bouncing back. Uh, and uh, actually there is uh, uh, expectation for uh, the, uh, the, 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 the easing of the, uh, of the current, uh, moder uh, accommodative uh, monetary policy. So I think the Fed just has made some remarks this afternoon. And also the other thing I learned from this uh, crisis, the value of collective actions. Like COVID-19, uh, each and every one of us has a responsibility due to ourselves and uh, all to ourselves and your loved ones and everyone in the world. You have to wear your mask, you have to keep, keep social distancing, just like climate change. You have to do your part. And uh, a financial institution, they have the money, they can make an impact. The question is how the regulator to guide them to mobilize the uh, private uh, funding to uh, the areas that in need to address the climate change risk. So um, I think as regulators so far, we should reinforce our focus on how financial institutions are managing and disclosing their climate related risk the second one is how regulatory supervisory measures might support ESG in investing, green bonds, and blended finance. So uh, this has uh, this uh, this kind of uh, uh, focus has been incorporated into our uh, financial uh, green finance action plan 2.0. Uh, I will take some time later to uh, explain. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um Ms. Fitz, did you want to uh, amplify or contribute or contrast how we're approaching it in the United States? Sure. Well, I mean, I'm on the international side of Treasury, so we look at this both from a development finance perspective on the MDBs and with BFC, and we think that I mean, COVID has certainly highlighted the need for um, a broader set of infrastructure. Um, and so both in terms of the digital, I think we're all now aware as, as we look at uh, where we're calling in to, to this discussion from, um, from cars and across different cities uh, of the need for digital infrastructure to uh, rural areas to all parts uh, of our country. And so making sure that we are as, you know, from policymakers encouraging that investment. Um, and from a health perspective, it's certainly, and, and, and beyond that, highlighted constraints in our supply chain uh, that were not as, uh, as big an issue before. Uh, so the USDFC and IFC together have done a number of investments uh, in expanding healthcare supply chains uh, and recently announced uh, funding for vaccine manufacturing in South Africa. I think it's mm. important to address those sorts of constraints. Um, but certainly an overarching lesson from COVID-19 pandemic is the need to be prepared in a general way for unexpected shocks, long-term consequences. So from a policy perspective, internationally, uh, Treasury is pleased to co-chair the Sustainable Finance Working Group in the G20. And we developed a climate-focused sustainable finance roadmap along with our G20 partners. And so in this 
This year, the SFWG plans to dedicate work to identifying ways to advance sustainability disclosure and reporting, improve compatibility and approaches for identifying climate aligned investments, and accelerate international financial institution support for the goals of the Paris Agreement. And those steps can ultimately um, ensure that investments that we do make are going to more resilient um, projects uh, and, and corporates um, that can impact natural disasters and future outbreaks. We also recently joined the Coalition for Finance Ministers for Climate Action. It's a group of 60 finance ministries that share experiences and best practices on strategies to integrate climate change in their economic and financial policies. It's critical that we are keeping these lines of communication open uh, as I think this pandemic has demonstrated that um, we are all impacted by each other's uh, countries and economies uh, and, and experiences. And in the development context, the U.S. Development Corporation, Development Finance Corporation, significantly upped its own climate ambition, pledging that it will allocate a third of its investment portfolio to climate-related investments. So we are also looking to expand that commitment. That's that's terrific, and a both expansive and potentially highly impactful array um, of activities. Um, I've been given the yellow card that I'm not doing uh, the job of keeping us on track as quickly and timeline as quickly as uh, as well as I might. So what I'd like to do is um, pivot to Ms. Steggy and to Brian Finley on, a, on a, another question, which is really important, which is the OECD data has shown so far that recovery funds spent by governments in 2021 thus far only about 17% have been allocated to environmentally positive projects. Um, how can we um, encourage more actors to invest in greener and more transformative productions, uh, products and uh, capabilities um, from from the you know at the ground level of the problem in in the Marshall Islands, Ms. Steggy? What would be the feedback you would give to those who are trying to deploy recovery money? Um, and what are the mechanisms by which you give that feedback? And then subsequently, Brian, um, are you all tracking this data set and helping people restack priorities as a consequence? So Ms. Steggy, what, what is the feedback you'd wanna uh, send up the stream, if you will? Thanks, um, thanks for that question. I, I think that um, for the Marshall Islands, at, you know, at the, at, at the domestic level, we've invested a lot into signaling um, to the world through our uh, 2050 strategy, you know, where we should be going as a country, but also in, in doing so, and you know, yes, it has in there um, a net zero strategy for 2050, but it also has in there a lot about um, investing in climate res resilient infrastructure, um, transitioning uh, away from fossil fuels. Uh, it, it is it's essentially a blueprint for um, green gr gr green development. Um, and and it's, it's, it's what is our guide and it, 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 it guides us and it's guiding our work now on a national adaptation plan that will dig deeper into the specifics of what are the particular kinds of investments um, in infrastructure uh, in different programs that will be needed to um, ensure that we are able to, you know, be here past 2050 as a country and as a nation. And so I think that uh, long-term strategies are an important signal that, that countries um, can, can give. Uh, in addition to that, I think um, for us locally, I think we have to understand that as a small country, and my country is 60,000 people, uh, we have, and this is something that's true across all SIDS, really, there are, there are capacity constraints for exactly what we can accomplish. And it is through the partnerships, like, we, like was mentioned, um, where USAID, for example, 
helped us secure the 25 million from from the GCF for for, for water management. You know, those kinds of um, partnerships are critical. But even more critically, I think we have to recognize that for us, the multilateral system is quite difficult to access. It is very, very difficult and um, it takes time. And at least for the Marshall Islands, time is a luxury we absolutely just do not have. And in that landscape, in that climate finance landscape, the, the bilateral partnerships, the bilateral agreements that are existing become even ever more important. Uh, and so with the United States, we have the Compact of Free Association. With Taiwan, um, we have a very strong partnership. Um, and these actually have really been able to support us through the COVID crisis uh, directly, just to go back to your former question, but I just really wanted to address this. Part of the reason I think we've been able to get through this crisis as well as we have, and by the way, we're COVID free in our country, but the reason that that has happened is really because of the of the assistance we were able to uh, get immediately, you know, right away through the CARES Act, um, uh, vaccine access that went to us as soon as it went to the states, uh, PCR tests and medical supplies that Taiwan was able to send to us directly. Those sorts of very quick actions um, respond in a way that's fit for purpose to the plans that we've put in place domestically. Uh, so I think that these two things together are really, um, the, are really the key for that's, a small island state like mine. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and Brian, just to, to sort of put that to you, I think this notion of being able to use data to help establish priorities, is it also, uh, are you getting to the point of using data to create metrics and cycle time measurement and such that this should how, how is how are you responding to this challenge yeah it's a great question john you know when you when you pose the the initial question it occurred to me 17 percent. i mean what a depressing statistic <laughs> that is uh uh but i think it's important it's really important to note that uh you know that that fact is not a function of you know, an, an an unenlightened constituency of investors and donors. It's just, it's a it, it's a reflection of the fact this is really hard. It's really difficult, and, uh, and so I think we need to recognize that. Uh, but also to your point, uh, uh, John, I, I think it's uh, it, it, part of the reason it is so hard is because there's a you know there's a dearth of good data out there. It's just difficult to 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 come to come by, and it's something that we. Uh, at Stimson, I think recognize as we sit in this privileged perch, uh, uh, being able to criticize uh, uh, USAID and other donors uh, 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 without ha having any real responsibility uh, for it. So, you know, trying to play our role, I, I think we, you know, decided that let's start with, you know, building solid, reliable data that can be uh that can be leveraged uh, and next i mean it certainly is it's also clear to me that that uh, we need to i think um in answer to your question john not just begin with data but also begin to demonstrate the benefits of investing in environmentally positive projects as you uh, as you phrase it for example i think you know kind of nature-based solutions uh, are are obviously critically uh, uh, um, uh, are, are are critical to to protecting vulnerable coastal areas uh, uh to the impacts of climate change but but uh, you know as coastal cities expand nature-based defenses of course are are degraded which heightens the flood the the risk of uh, of, of floods and and so forth and, and and i think development comes obviously at the expense of uh, of nature which makes which makes uh um uh, coast coastal areas obviously much more vulnerable to to disasters and so how do we kind of quantify risk around these consistently changing dynamics uh, on the ground. And I think identifying those um, kind of resilience uh, or resilience investments and, and costing projects over the life cycle uh, rather than only uh, against upfront costs is obviously essential to this. And, and those decisions, again, rely upon good data. Um, uh, just because you teed me up for this, John, I think that the, the Corvi that I mentioned is, is just one element of that. Uh, but, but in short, uh, just to cut this uh, already long intervention shorter, uh, I, I think it's pretty clear, John, that we need to 
kind of better measure the upsides of those green investments that we're right. making in order to create that kind of virtuous uh, cycle for both government as well as uh, as private uh, as well as private sector investors. And then well, just I, when I, if I, if I made just one last sentence, uh, John, I just want to highlight something that. Uh, um, our, our colleague from the Marshall Islands, you know, we when we, I think, here in Washington and elsewhere, hear the term uh, resource constraints, you know, our minds immediately go to dollars and cents, and that's a big part of it, to be sure. Uh, but I think, you know, through our engagement in the Pacific Islands, in the Caribbean, uh, when they say resource constraints, they don't just mean that, I think. I think uh, it, it certainly means resource constraints, but it also is a human capacity constraint. I mean, when we think about the team that Lita has uh, to support her important work, that Craig has to support his important work, that Taiwan ICDF has to support their important work. These are large teams. Uh, you know, our colleague at the Marshall Islands, I, I suspect, has I, not I, a large team to uh, you know to work on these issues. So I think we also need to be sensitive to the kind of the human uh, constraints that uh, that our colleagues in in small island and uh, states have as well. Thank you very much. And what I'd like to do is sort of combine those two elements and propose uh, combine the third, uh, you know, the last two questions into one and really address this initially uh, to the good ambassador, which is um, how, you know, hearing that mu large multilateralism is great, but it's never going to be quick. <laughs> Um, and as you get down to bilateralism, it can be more nimble, more responsive. Um, and so how can the United States and Taiwan collaborate to both accelerate sustainable finance? And, and I would, I would foot stomp for the benefit of our regulators and policymakers here. Something Brian said, which is making sure that scorecards and rule book actually are inclusive of the factors of both long-term and short-term benefit. That by nature, by your very natures, you're uh, guarding against the risks, but trying to enable virtuous behaviors at the same time. And allowing those virtuous outcomes to be fully incorporated is something, you know, I, I for one who lived in a regulated environment for most of my adult life, um, which sounds a little strange. So I'll say, I haven't been incarcerated. I've been subject to the <laughs> Fed and Treasury. Um, but, but Mr. Ambassador, how can Taiwan and the US and, and really Craig weigh in on this as well? How do we work together and set a great example for small coalition collaboration for big impacts? Mr. Ambassador? I think now we're living in a flowery situation, flow is uncertainty. And one of the most visible consequences of warning world is an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. And the COVID-19 pandemic further accepts, ex exhibits inequalities and strengthens the achievement of SDGs. So the need from developing countries are increasing and this requires a global partnership for, to fear in the gap of sustainable and lived in a regulator 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 found the challenges caused directly or indirectly by the pandemic so given the even more limited resources like mighty countries and the partners need to prioritize the investment for better outcome uh, we should dedicate to resource mobilization within our network the Taiwan ICDF is seeking innovative ways to catalyze sustainable finance by encourage, encouraging public-private partnership and building strong partnership with international allies such as USID, DFC, think tanks, and civil societies. Just as early Mr. Craig mentioned, that what we have done so far to cooperate with USID, and we consider establishing regular communication channels to be the foundation of partnerships. And we hope to continue this valuable dialogues to unite consensus and resources from the like many countries. Thank you. Greg, would you like to um, sort of speak to how we in Taiwan might collaborate uh, 
in on, on a more robust basis to accelerate sustainable finance? So, John, I'm, I'm going to suggest that um, looking at the private sector partners and that is a sector that we work with every day across all of the development fields that we're engaged with is absolutely critical in this. We have private sector partners who are pushing us and we're pushing together um, to achieve some of these green goals. And that is an area that we have to take better advantage of and really recognize the opportunities for partnerships as many private sector firms are, have set their own uh, green goals in terms of green energy and, and otherwise, um, that we can work together with them and the substantial finances that they bring to the table to be able to achieve this. And, I, and I've seen this in a number of our countries throughout Asia, um, where we're working together hand in hand with the private sector working with host governments to be able to find out what makes the most sense in this partnership because they have significant resources to bring to bear and we need to be very well in tune with supporting what they are already they've already set for themselves in terms of green growth thanks well thanks very much i mean ms stega speaking of the private sector um has that been a source of uh potential partnership to you or do you mostly access the private investment sector through your government to government relations? No, I think for a country might like mine, it's it's the it's the public financing that's going to be key. And I, I and, and in particular, in particular, and this is not just the case for the Marshall Islands, but across the board, I think globally. Um, when it comes to adaptation financing, um, it's very, very difficult to um, be looking to private sources of funding for that. I think it, it has been proven that on the on the uh, mitigation side for renewable energy, um, there's a lot of financing that is available through uh, the private sector, um, but not necessarily in small countries like mine that just don't have the scale to produce um, the returns. And so, for example, just to give you one number, uh, we have a electricity roadmap um, that very clearly spells out what's needed to transition us to renewables. And while we've made progress on that and we've, able, we've been able to secure some funding from that um, from public sources, it's still underfunded by about 100 to 120 million. Um, and that's after many rounds of, 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 of looking for how, how to secure that, that financing. That's for, that's, that's for renewable energy. Um, when it comes to adaptation, which may include things like shoring up islands or even elevating islands, um, you know, there's maybe not a monetary return, but there is a, a return in terms of, you know, the continued existence of a, of a nation, of a country, of a culture. Um, and that's that's a different kind of financing. Uh, so, I, I, one thing that we're doing, at least at the international level, the multilateral level, we're trying to to we we agree with um, the UN Secretary General's call for the fifty fifty split on mitigation and adaptation financing. In part, simply to send that I, we think it's important that countries, particular donor countries, send the signal to the MDBs and other financial institutions that adaptation needs to be uh, elevated um, as the means by which uh, globally uh, we can become more resilient and able, able to face the, the climate crisis. Well, thank you very much. I mean, uh, Brian or uh, Lida, the developing carbon markets are somehow going to end up being enablers for uh, adaptation finance. So, for example, um, in the form of blue carbon, you know, as coastal climate and coastal ecosystems could be investable, if you will, as adaptation finance, um, if in fact they could be monetized through uh, you know, sort of the environmental attributes. Is this something, again, it's markets can't form until they have information. 
once markets have information, they can devise ways to allocate and prioritize capital. Can you see a role for the Stimson Center in helping um, kind of define and enrich and inform some of these uh, potential areas with more data? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no question. I mean, it's 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 precisely what we're doing. Again, thanks to a collaboration with Taiwan ICDF, uh, uh, John. I I think all of this starts with good data. Now, you've spent your career in 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 private industry. I think our colleagues in government would, uh, you know, they likewise rely on the same <laughs> the same type of data in order to make, uh, in order to make decisions in real time. And I I think to your point, I mean, the, uh, the United States and in Taiwan, uh, you know, if we're looking for areas of, of collaboration, if it starts with good data, why not focus uh, some level of resources there uh, that could potentially have a leverageable effect, right? If, if we can uh, generate together uh, that uh, exact data that that, uh, that you just referred to, John, it was a great example. Um, and so, Lida, from your perspective, do you see uh, tension or um, sort of the ability to collaborate with uh, banks and other financial institutions to, if only to permit, if not even enable, sort of the growth of these markets, which can bridge the gap between adaptation and monetization of attributes. I think from Treasury's perspective, we certainly want to encourage the growth of those markets. Um, and I'd also, highlight uh, that we are completely in line with Brian's points on data and the importance of data in driving those. Um, and so from an international perspective, that's really been a chant we've been helping to lead in the G20 um, on quality infrastructure investment principles. And many of the things Brian noted in terms of life cycle costing um, are, are part of that. But a big part, I think, of driving investment are the ESG principles and making sure that the that data around those projects um, and companies uh, can come out into the market and that there's a way to put that out in the least cost um, and, and quickest way possible. So, you know, having the same measures for each project and across countries, I think, is one enabler. So that's uh, really something that the Treasury has been um, has been raising repeatedly as a top priority amongst our G20 partners. Uh, and we see that is very much um, focused on unlocking a lot of the incredibly quickly expanding demand for ESG investment. Um, and, and, and I think if we're going to take advantage of that, it's got to be you know, clear what those investments are. And I think also a degree of confidence by investors that those uh, investments are what they say they are. Well, thanks very much. And so, um, Ms. Steggy, uh, I'm gonna turn back to you and then also the ambassador um, about what, what are your expectations uh, for the development of green and, and inclusive sustainable development. I mean, what, what do you, what are your nearest term requirements, Ms. Steggy? And Mr. Ambassador, what are your near term plans uh, for promoting the growth of inclusive and sustainable investment? Ms. Steggy, what about your, your near term sort of threats and requirements? And so how might we match those with capital? I mean, in the near term, our focus domestically right now is uh, on producing a national adaptation plan that is uh, robust, that, you know, is underpinned by um, da data, um, science, projections about what's going to happen and therefore what might be needed. Uh, looking ahead, we think um, further donor coordination that, that can align with those local adaptation plans will be key and will underpin broader sustainable development goals for the country. And just to give one example, you know, with Taiwan's help, we've, we've been able to put in just solar streetlights in Madro where I grew up um, just a few years back. And, you know, if you drive down the one street that, ex that is in, in my home island, um, you will see the flags of both countries on those lights, which, you know, it's a symbol, it's a symbol of the partnership um, and a, a par partnership that's working. Um, so, 
you know, these types of sustainable development initiatives initiatives are key to helping the RMI meet its climate change goals. And we'd love to work with Taiwan and the U.S. more to, to identify more projects like that, but also to go beyond projects. As as I've said before, I mean, for our country, it's 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 really going to be transformative um, adaptation action that that kind of looks at things across the board and the bilateral structures that we have in place like the compact looking at those and ensuring that those are climate sensitive um, and and focused on climate resilience which to be to be frank is, is not necessarily the case right now so just really infusing that climate perspective into the existing relationships that we have and that are strong to to essentially make them you know ready for the next um, 10 years 15 years 50 years thanks Mr. Ambassador or, or Ms. Liu, would you like to make a, another comment about goals and, and expectations? Uh, well, I believe to achieve a green and inclusive future, uh, we need an open platform and a comprehensive discussion uh, so that we can steer all partners toward the same direction. And we know the U.S. government held a leader summit on climate back in April this year, and it rallied the world in tackling the climate crisis and meeting the demands of science, and it resulted in strengthened commitments to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. So under this framework, the Taiwan SDF can work with USID to support our developing allied countries to move forward to a more sustainable and resilient future by facilitating the implementation of national, nationally determined contributions and national adaptation strategies. Taiwan is an island country with a vast experience in clean energy, sustainable agriculture and fishery, biodiversity protection, and marine conservation that can be shared with other island countries for green investment. We have 22 uh, permanent techno missions around the world to provide people to people advanced techno support. So to transform these ideas into actions, our Taiwan-U.S. cooperation on the Pacific American Fund in climate change and disaster resilience can be a great start to form a stronger alliance in the Pacific region. The Children Fund is still under discussion, but we believe it will be a catalyst for further investment and, and lead to the governments to build a green, more inclusive environment and head to a narrow net zero future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Ms. Liu? Thank you, John. So, as I mentioned earlier, the job of uh, regulators is to make capital flows consistent with low emissions climate resilient pathways while maintaining the safeness and the sound, uh, safety and the soundness of the financial system. So, uh, as I have introduced earlier, we have a green finance action plan. We have two objectives we want to reach in the short term and the uh, media long term. So uh, for the short term objective is to build up a framework and the foundation infrastructure conductive to the effective operation of sustainable finance, uh, increase information transparency and the channel funds to su support uh, green development industries. So the short term uh, action focus on enhancing the disclosure of climate related information, like we are going to adopt the TCFD uh, disclosure, information disclosure by uh, 2023. And uh, for the uh, medium term objectives of our action plans to guide the financial institution addressing the potential climate related risk and capitalize on the uh, opportunities we uh, want to bring about an ecosystem of investment and sustainable development the most important thing is how to improve the data quality so i'm in, uh, very excited to introduce you that uh, the sac uh, right now we are working with uh, a lot of agencies domestically to collect more data for financial institution like the rainfall amount, the temperature, to uh, have an integrated database for they to conduct their scenario analysis testing for the future to address their risk. Uh, eventually, they will uh, that will help the uh, 
invest more in the uh, green finance and the ESG uh, investment because they know how to address the risk, how to mitigate the risk. So um, in terms of the uh, future cooperation with the U.S., as a matter of fact, at FSC, we already started our, initiated our dialogues with our U.S. counterpart, um, mainly the Federal Reserve Board and the New York regulators. Uh, we have discussion on how to address the climate risk uh, in terms of the safety and the soundness of the financial institutions, uh, financial systems. And uh, moving forward, we are, uh, the FSC, we also look, uh, looking forward to have more, to having more opportunities to continue our uh, cooperation and the exchange info, uh, information experience of promoting sustainable finance we, uh, with the uh, U.S. and the other regions, government and the private sectors, so, such as the uh, how to uh, deal with the transition finance, the filling the gaps of climate data, the integration of disclosure standards, and the establishment of the uh, climate-related risk assessment mechanism. That's pretty much it. Well, thank you very much. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I'll I'll look to Regine Liu to give us the sort of last-minute warning. But I'd like to just take a minute to summarize sort of what I've heard. And thank you all very much. But what I've heard is we have both a challenge and an opportunity where we live at a time where decarbonization, climate adaptation, and digital transformation are all coming together. And you know, when I when I think about it as someone from the private sector and as an as a an investor, um, there's both uh, there's opportunity in there. So when one looks at the Pacific Islands taken as a whole, it was estimated by the Asian Development Bank that it would cost roughly 5.2 billion to smart grid the entire island nation population of a dozen or more island nations. So 5.2 billion is a lot of money, but the average electricity price in the region is 32 cents a kilowatt hour. So by application of technology, reducing the cost of generation, transmission, distribution, and increasing the efficiency of consumption. I think there we're beginning to see win-win opportunities that could, could present themselves at truly material scale. So um, if you think about those and, and some of the great examples that Craig put forward at scale, like in Vietnam, where Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, but you not only changed the power generation source mix, but you probably also averaged down the cost of power in the region. Isn't that correct? Or in the country, rather? John, ongoing conversations on that, no doubt, in terms of the actual effect. Um, but but that was a case of, and continues to be a case of working together with the private sector, who has committed to um, off taking that green energy, and the producers, who have seen an opportunity uh, within a within a time span that Vietnam actually put forward a. Um, uh, incentivizing tariff on that. And so it really is a great example of the, the three different entities coming together to make of that, make all of that work. So uh, we're into the last minute. So I want to thank all of our speakers, give you a great round of a virtual applause. Um, and um, uh, with the permission of uh, regime Liu and Taiwan ICDF and USAID, and U.S. Treasury and everyone else, I'll, I'll, I'll call the proceedings to a close and say hey, thank you all very much for both contributing your time, your intellectual content, and to our audience, your concentration. So thanks very much and goodbye and good night from the roadside of Interstate 95 in suburban Washington, D.C. Thank you all very much. Good night and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.